uh, start the last uh, substantive session of the day. As I was forewarning the panelists uh, that uh, any any questions that our audience has not asked and has uh, gathered during the day, uh, they might be firing out. Uh, so uh, absolutely do that. Um, so we have uh, the largest panel um, for today. And um, let me start out by um, asking our colleagues to introduce themselves. I think that'd be um, a, a good way. And then also, um, in doing that, also giving an, an overview of kind of, if you'd have to give a, a general state of play to this question that we have on the, on the, on the panel, cooperation with fintechs. We heard a bit of this uh, earlier in the days. We were discussing open banking, and of course, in the introductory presentations uh, by uh, Jitz and, uh, and by uh, Marty uh, from the uh, SAB Bank. Um, so, over to you. Thank you. Um, can I just clarify, you, you want me to introduce um, the role and also the, yeah. the general uh, yeah. positions by Bankas yes. to, to fintechs? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm uh, Jonas Lagerstedt. I'm uh, head of what we call the fintech office, which means that it's a um, coordinating function for everything we do in related to fintech, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, digital optimization. So, so these three areas under one umbrella. Um, and we do, do that because we think uh, these areas are closely related. There are a lot of fintech companies in the fields of automation and artificial intelligence. Um, we also think that you know, what we need to do in these areas, it's uh, relevant for all parts of the bank, so it makes sense to have it in, in coordinated under one roof in, in the bank. It's a new function. It's, it's new since the um, beginning of December. <coughs> so that's me um, and the role. Uh, given Swedbank and, and fintechs, I think you've heard a bit already. Uh, you heard Hans in the previous session here talking about uh, our, our bot. Uh, Geertz and Emma has been here before talking about a few things. So I, I, and I wasn't here, unfortunately, so I'm not sure if I'm kind of uh, uh, repeating what they already said. Not, uh, yet. not, not yet. Not yet. Not no, yet. That, that's good. <laughs> so there is still a chance. Um, well, generally, uh, I think we are extremely positive to uh, to fintechs and fintech collaborations and new technologies. We think that, you know, th those days when we as a bank could rely on captive solutions and, and our own capabilities, uh, they, are, they are gone since long. Uh, we will get a much better development if we work with, uh, you know, many players in many different fields and really our core capability is to learn how to collaborate, how to work with these players in a good way. Small, uh, medium-sized uh, and, lar and large. I mean, it, it's not really um, the maturity or, or the size of the organization that matters, it's really what, what they can provide. We have one focus, which is, is uh, uh, customer benefit. We want to make sure that our customers get the best services that you can get. Uh, and that kind of is the, the guiding star for everything we do in this field. Um, and I would like to emphasize that it's not only uh, services, applications, collaborations related to the customer interface. It's just as well a lot in the back end in order to make all processes more straight through, more, uh, more a better customer experience all the way through. What was the rationale for the fintech office in December? That's um, quite new. Yeah, it's quite new. Uh, I think it was because uh, we felt in the bank that the, what we needed to do and what we were doing in these areas, it, it you know increased in scale, so so uh, you know it started to pop up every here and there, and we needed to make sure that we actually do it the right way. And and of course there's also a lot of of regulation compliance related issues, so uh, you know putting requirements on knowing what we're doing and why. Right. Okay. So to you. Okay. I'll uh, make use of this one, I think. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good to be here. My name is Christina Soderberg. I work at SAB Venture Capital. Uh, it's been around a bit longer than December, uh, almost 25 years, actually. So it's the investment arm of SAB. Uh, it started out on a very small scale, and today we have uh, it's an evergreen fund of about 2 billion Swedish crowns uh, that we can invest in, uh, in startups. Uh, We've done so for quite some time, a bit over 100 investments. Uh, to date, we have a portfolio of about 20 companies, and eight out of them are fintechs. Uh, but it's only actually for the last two years that we've been focusing on, uh, on fintech investments. Uh, so it's been a sort of a new journey for me as well to look into technology that can serve uh, the financial services. 
uh, it could either be just like you say something that will help the bank to be more cost efficient uh, I think we talk about blockchain later on that will be one of those aspects uh, but also investing into companies that uh, do the innovation that the banks don't have time to do while they're uh, uh, getting quite harsh demands on their regulation side. Uh, so that's what I do. We're a team of seven people uh, working with investments and it's all about, of course, identifying, uh, establishing relations with the startups and uh, eventually to make the investment and then we work on the boards uh, together with these companies uh, and that's how we how we get to know them and as part of sort of the learning side for, for SCB as well. Uh, so 100 yeah. in total over 25 years, how many active in portfolio right now? Uh, so the active portfolio now is about 20 companies. All Not all fintech? Uh, no, eight of them are fintech. Okay. Uh, but I work with, with both both uh, those. And the sort of the legacy from us is doing more deep tech investments. Uh, so last year I sold a company to Microsoft. Some years before that, uh, we sold a company to Cisco. Uh, so it's a bit of a different... And I think that's also interesting when we talk about the fintech sector. It's it's sort of just popped up, uh, the sort of the fintech definition that we have today. Uh, and many of them are very focused on innovation when it comes to customer experience. Uh, they're taking a solution that the banks can offer already today, but make it more digitalized. They can do it cheaper because they don't have their legacy costs. Uh, while us, our team have been sort of more searching for this, these more deep tech solutions uh, when we come to AI and solutions that can be used more for uh, making the banks more cost efficient. Uh, and I think, and we also see uh, when it comes to the flow of, uh, uh, of companies that we're looking to that it's also changing from being more uh, app dominated to being more of a important technology for, for the banks going forward. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting to see. I'll we'll take forward in more detail. Ah, so Kim, uh, yeah, we have the second mic. Yeah. Um, so is this it, it, work, it will work as you start talking. Ah, work. Great, yeah, it works. I just need to be very close to it. Um, so my name is Kim Lazars. I work as a product owner for the uh, mobile application for ICB, mainly targeted at consumers. So uh, in a sense, I have, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the agile development. We have a severe, uh, severe backlog uh, of things that we want to accomplish. And uh, in that backlog, we have elements from all, all sides of the organization. So we have payments, loans, finance products, anything. And as we look into our backlog, we have so many different ideas coming from everywhere, basically. We have um, fintechs providing ideas. F for instance, Tink, which I'm sure we're going to talk about a little bit more later. We also have the innovations that comes from within SCB. So my job is really to make sure that we prioritize correct and that we go along with the, with the right thing we need to do at the moment, basically. So when we assess what we need to do. We work from a model which is based on four dimensions. We put the customer in the center and then we work our way through uh, helping the customer to see their financial situation and their uh, economic activity to understand and make sense of that and, uh, and further on to come up with a suggestion for a decision. What do you want to achieve? What, what is it that you want with your financial situation? and finally give them the tools to act upon that. And when we look at uh, fintech collaborations, they can really help us out in that model. That is the um, core mission for SEB Digital Banking, to be able to provide that, see, understand, decide, and act. And uh, to be able to really help the customer. Uh, and using fintechs, I'm, I'm gonna go into Tinkle just a little bit here. Uh, and uh, the data they can provide. They can really make that experience a complete new one. So I, I, as we mentioned before, I see very positive. I think that we have uh, great opportunities to continue working in that path when we're able to deliver some sort of added value or a lot of added value onto our core, uh, own core services, basically, using a collaboration. I think we're going to see more of that, mm -hmm. very much more of that. Okay, great. So, Yuri, over to you. Hello, my name is Yuri Laur. Um, I represent LHV Bank here, but uh, essentially I'm not a banker. Um, my background is Silicon Valley uh, giants, 
really like Kurt's referenced uh, earlier this morning, um, they are coming. So my previous position was at Microsoft and they were tackling India three years ago. So uh, that's pretty much done by now, I'm sure. So uh, they are coming pretty soon. So that's a warning to you <laughs> all. Um, but in terms of what, what LHV is doing with fintechs, I think there's, there's three pillars, really. One of them um, is firstly that we are a fintech ourselves, uh, even though we're a bank. So it's not based only because I have brave choice in sock colors, but um, it's based on the fact that uh, more than 30% of our staff is IT today, and this is full-time employees. Uh, with contractors, that's the percentage is probably much, much higher. Uh, so it's fully technology-driven. Um, also, we've been able to keep our staff numbers below 400 for a, for a number of years now. And this is by choice, because we, we choose to, to escalate and scale our business uh, through technology rather than people. Um, the same goes for, for branches. We still operate two branches. Um, there's no need for us to only operate two branches. It's a, it's a, it's a knowing choice because we want to service our customers uh, first and foremost through, through digital platforms. It used to be internet bank, now it's mobile. Um, the only physical presence that we are expanding is, is the, the ATM network, and even that is, is, is more like a promotional activity rather than a, a need itself. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar is, is we do collaborate um, as a small bank, and there are areas where we are very good at, and there are areas you know, where we aren't that good. So, so there's a couple of different um, uh, service providers we use um, from fintech sector. So we have a long-term partnership with, with a company called TransferWise, you've probably heard of. Um, so we were, I think, the first bank who integrated TransferWise uh, international payments into the internet bank. Um, sure, we might have lost a couple of euros on, on the transaction fees, uh, because we're not charging for the service. Uh, it's, it's fully just integrated for the, for the usage of our customers. But uh, we, we feel it's, it's worth it. Um, we, we do have an a artificial intelligence chatbot ourselves. It's a he, by the way. It's called <laughs> Uku. Um, he's, um, he's not the brightest yet. We've just started training him last year. But he's, 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 he's doing great work on, on becoming a much better service channel. So right now he lives in, in Facebook chat, but we're looking to, to expand him to, to other channels as well. Um, recently, we, we have the opportunity to onboard customers through video. So we partnered with a company called The Riff, who, who helps us onboard through, through video chat and where, where they do biometric uh, uh, tracking of the faces, et cetera. So we, we do use, the, use those components and, and, um, and collaborate with these companies, which is a, a, a different task at some times, but um, maybe I'll talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly, we also provide infrastructure to, to, to fintech. So um, it's, it's funny, so with TransferWise, for example, where we consume their services, we also provide them infrastructure for their Europe payments. Um, and not only for them, we, we have a portfolio of, of companies whom we provide infrastructure services for. Um, and for that specific reason, we're um, uh, opening a branch in the UK this year uh, in London um, to, to service fintechs only. Uh, so infrastructure offering, euro payments, pound payments. Yeah, yeah. yeah Katrin. Yes, today we have had a, a really very uh, lively discussion uh, and it, it has been focused on how to cooperate in the best way with the fintechs. Uh, we have had, heard and seen the very nice examples uh, of the new services and products uh, um, developed by the banks and as large uh, fintech companies themselves or the new services that are a result of very good cooperation or which are in the pipeline and coming very soon. But so far, mm, uh, we can say that there are uh, various um, uh, possible models of cooperation. Uh, my question to all the panelists is that so far, we haven't heard anything about uh, cooperation uh, between the banks itself. What is uh, your attitude? Is uh, this something that you are looking for? Is it possible? Is it on the pipeline already? What is your experience and what are your expectations? Good. So I think... Uh, should, I, um, yep. should I go first with the mic? Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting area. Uh, there is, um, you know, there, there, there are always 
um, ideas, discussions between the banks on how we can collaborate in various areas, specifically uh, around, you know, in the fintech space. Um, um, maybe um, I, I'm not aware of any you know, specific ones we can mention here, but I would expect there will be uh, more and more of that because I think collaboration as such is, is going to be or is already very, very important also between the banks. And, and uh, I can imagine like the banks have collaborated around the, the bank gyro, around the UC, around, you know. UC, bank gyro. Let's spell out a bit uh, <laughs> for the audience here. So, so there, there are many, there are many uh, traditionally in, in the Swedish and Nordic banking, there are companies, you know, that are utilities for the bank where the banks collaborate because it's, they are not typically differentiating the, the competitiveness of the banks, but it's, it's a good way to, to share your infrastructure. Uh, I think it will, it will probably even going forward be difficult for banks to collaborate in the customer interface because that's where we compete. But in terms of, of you know, the, uh, the, what is infrastructure, we could definitely do it. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't want to mention any specific area right now. Uh, and I could just uh, echo that. I mean, just like you mentioned, we have the uh, information you see where they provide banks with information about the companies and the payment systems that we have in Sweden and also uh, now quite recently switch when the banks came together to say so that we individuals but also uh, to companies we can pay using our mobile phones uh, connected to the uh, the mobile number that we have uh, and that's uh, done between the banks and also the bank ID which is how we identify ourselves uh, more and more in Sweden uh, so I think the Swedish banks have proved very well. Uh, it would be interesting to hear how it actually works in the various Baltic countries. Uh, if you have, I mean, I know that both our banks are fairly uh, <laughs> uh, available there, but do you have a comment? Yes. Uh, maybe you can more comment on this uh, switch system, because we know that uh, this uh, this uh, works well between uh, Nordic countries. But uh, what about the opportunities for other countries, for example, for, for uh, Baltics? So let's start with explaining to those who don't know what the switch system is, uh, and then switch, and, and, yes. then, uh, and then proceed to answer the question. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm the sort of technical expert of, <laughs> of the product or solution as such, but uh, I think that in general it's a problem for these banks' uh, combined solutions that we have. For example, the Swish, where you can you just use your phone to uh, transfer money to uh, to your friends, or also when you're in a shop, you can use your phone to just transfer money uh, directly to uh, to that company uh, bank account. But um, the um, both when it comes to Switch, but also Bank ID, their mission is not to to uh, solve solutions or problems outside of, as I have understand and had some discussion as well, outside of the sort of home market, uh, which I think is a bit of a pity because if you, just like any fintech, if you will survive as being the most and best used solution, you have to be able to also provide that solution into other markets. Otherwise, at some point, they will come if that's a, a Microsoft or if that's a Samsung or whoever it might be, uh, or another fintech, they will, of course, try to conquer the whole market with such a solution. Uh, so I think it's a bit of pity that mm -hmm. today, at least, it seems like both the Swiss solution and uh, the bank ID solution is going to stay within the Swedish borders. Uh, I don't know if, for example, in, in Norway, they have several Swiss solutions, which sort of, if you don't have one and single one, then uh, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, the whole point is that everybody, uh, and there was no marketing made, and just within, I mean, now it's been a few years, but more or less everybody uses it. It's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So ages. The, uh, I guess part of the answer is that maybe Jirts can uh, or Ilya can add is the instant payment solution in the case of Latvia, given that we're in the Eurozone, right? So that's that's part of the answer. Now, you're not yet, uh, the, the discussions are that you might be <laughs> in the Eurozone. So I don't know if we might take that one on, on the side. Uh, yeah. I think his answer on Swiss is that uh, it's not... Uh, 
kind of relevant because insta except instant payments are coming to, to, to Baltics or Eurozone. This is one. And the uh, bank ID, yes, this was first thing we tried to bring bank ID to Baltics and it was not possible because of ownership structure because there are banks uh, who are owners who are presented in Baltics and then there are banks who are not presented in Baltics and those who are not uh, were actually mm -hmm. blocking it. So okay. Simple, exact. But I'd actually like to um, to come back to Christina, and I'll ask her specifically to talk about one of the investments that uh, the SEB um, uh, venture um, have uh, have made and are participating in the R3, which is a blockchain uh, consortium uh, of a quite a large number of banks, uh, and maybe talking through. Um, what is the idea, how, how is that, that number of banks has come together, and where are we from the concept to potential deployment on, on that particular solution? Mm. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting collaboration investment or project, or what, what you would call it. Uh, so I actually came back from maternity leave uh, end of summer 2015, and uh, then all of this sort of fintech, blockchain, Bitcoin, everybody started talking about things that I hadn't heard that much about before. Uh, and then more or less the same time, SAB joined something called R3, uh, becoming the member of this. Uh, so I think there were about 10 or 11 member banks that uh, started supporting this idea of, um, of establishing and, and uh, developing a platform for blockchain-based uh, infrastructure for the banks. Uh, and they are uh, more or less addressing, I mean, various areas within the bank and to sort of respond to the last aspect of the question. Uh, we yet haven't seen, I would say, the sort of any final uh, technical solution that banks are implementing yet, but there are lots of interesting use cases. Uh, and I was in London now earlier this, uh, this, this autumn and you see that there is a lot of interest and attention from all the banks. So eventually, it took a year later, and then uh, about 40 banks decided to join in and... Uh, 40 for zero. 40, uh, yeah. exactly. Global, European? Uh, global, so global. all the way from yeah, South America, North America, Asia, Europe, uh, Australia. Uh, so it was quite interesting to be on those uh, weekly calls uh, with the lawyers to uh, make 40 banks agree on uh, something uh, versus then the, the founders and the team of this uh, uh, quite a sort of a high fly um, mm -hmm. uh, venture. Uh, but so far, so good, I must say. It's uh, sort of the reasoning why SAB decided to join uh, was that we wanted to explore how blockchain uh, technology could actually help us in the future. Uh, and this was a very good way of, uh, of doing it. Uh, so now we're actually on the board of, uh, of that company. Uh, it's uh, Paula da Silva, who is head of transaction services within SAB. And um, uh, yeah, lot, lots of people with inside SAB is uh, engaged in supporting the different use cases. And what are the different use cases? Maybe you can try to talk so us through a few. Yeah, um, not sure if I can <laughs> elaborate on all of them, but uh, and different banks work on different use cases. Uh, so it's very driven by the individual members uh, and investors, what they want to uh, get out of the... Um, this partnership and uh, what they want them to focus on when they build the platform. Um, so we've been uh, working on on fund settlements. Uh, we're working on uh, smart contracts. Uh, we've been working on. Uh, I know we've done a Ripple, uh, which is not R three. So it's not that just because we invest into one case, we're not going to try other uh, providers. Ripple, Ethereum, and uh, Fabric Hyperledger is also other providers of blockchain-based uh, technology. But how Corda, uh, that's the name of Arthur's product, how they stand out is because they can manage to keep information private. I mean, the whole thing with the blockchain is to make it uh, centralized and make the information available for everybody. While as we all know that bank information should not be available for everybody. So that's, uh, uh, that's what R3 have managed to, to focus on and actually to solve that, that issue. So if, if there is a transaction, it's between me and Jonas, we can make sure that not everybody sees the details of that transaction. So that's sort of the, that's worth remembering when you sort of look into the different uh, technological solutions of the, yeah, I would say the four main providers that we have today at least. Mm -hmm. 
So R3, then uh, with all the smart contracts and, and, and the clearing and the settlement processes is working on a global legislation level. So in other words, uh, that's the a bit of a challenge for our policymakers to understand where do we fit in with the regulations we are. So in terms of the, or is this London-based regulations that are currently being taken as the basis? Uh, how do you see that evolving? I think that they today develop solutions for various... Some solutions can be more global, more or less other ones have to be uh, more local ge geographically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, of course, also the challenge. And I think that's what we hopefully will get to see during 2018, how these are connected into the actual systems. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one thing to just try out uh, making payments uh, using Ripple, uh, for example, or using uh, the Corda, but to make it work every day, uh, every minute of the hour. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess one of the, is the uh, challenge. As, as you're saying, one of the key problems that uh, the R3 and, and similar ones are, are setting out to do is to solve the uh, transborder, cross-border payments issues. So um, uh, maybe uh, our colleague from LHV wants to come in uh, here on, on a specific example, as Katrin asked. Sure, I mean, um, one, of the, one of the collaborations with, with TransferWise I, I mentioned earlier, um, does tackle the international payments uh, issue, let's say. There's a lot of people who are solving it right now, so I'm not really sure it's an issue anymore, to be honest. I think there are uh, way bigger issues already, yeah. um, and uh, the market is getting uh, kind of chopped up already by different different players. Mm. Uh, but it, it, it was a, a, a good timing for us because, uh, because of uh, the Deutsche Bank uh, de-risking itself from the Baltic countries. Uh, for smaller banks, USD became a problem, and, and at least we had the transferwise solution at hand to, to enable our, our customers to pay out in USD um, and in other, well, not so exotic currencies compared to USD. Um, so, so that was a, a good example for us. But uh, I think another topic that we haven't touched on is that uh, with with fintechs, there's also come some some burden when you work with fintechs, right? So if if you take a a fintech company and use it as a part of your business process, there's bound to be some issues. Um, so uh, it's not for the faint of heart. So I've, I've been dealing with some very odd, odd issues in the past. So a couple of examples. Uh, we run our own cryptocurrency projects as well. Um, so in one situation, I've, I've had to move our development team from a war zone to a non-war zone, which happened during the Ukrainian conflict. So they were in Donbass. We had to relocate them because well, there was a war outside. Um, we, we've had companies pivot mid-product launch. Basically, it's, I think working with a fintech is a bit like hiring a millennial. It's, uh, you know, at, at some point, they're, they're brilliant. They pick up things really fast. It's going really well. And then they decide to start a vegan bakery in Indonesia, and they just disappear. So you, you always have to kind of work with them and, and, um, and keep an eye on them and make sure you have a backup plan. So. It's kind of my, my word of advice because we've, we've used Finsex for, for different aspects in our business and uh, you still have to make sure that the core business areas are, are covered um, so you wouldn't, ha wouldn't run into any major troubles. And there are simpler things like, like business processes change and no one bothers to notify you, uh, stuff like that. So, so it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Actually, uh, brings us nicely to what we discussed uh, with Kim in preparation. So maybe taking us through some of these examples from the the concept uh, stage to the actual deployment stage uh, in a, on a mass scale. Exactly. Um, when I, I, I recognize a lot of what you're saying uh, on your experiences. Um, fortunately, Tink is located in Stockholm. It's a team. Um, when we started working with them, they were not so big. They were quite small. So uh, we definitely had to think about the fact that we need a backup plan. We need to know what's going to happen in case we... Wait, just think. Yeah? What is Tink? Tink. I, uh, yeah, well, maybe I should go into what yep. Tink really is. Yeah. Uh, so Tink is, a, um, is an application. They launched an application and a, and a platform for uh, transactional analysis. So basically they take all your transactions and your, all your accounts and put a category on them. And through that category, you can fetch information on your spending, on your saving, or on your budget. If you want to set the saving goal, they have a, uh, so many different use cases. But uh, it's really information inside the transaction. 
and that is very interesting for us. So when we started to look at, I think before, before my time working with this, um, we, we actually tried this out ourselves at one point in time. We tried to make an, an iPad application, and trying to anal analyze all the transactions we have, put categories on them, provide a sort of insight into, uh, another sort of insight into your uh, financial situation that goes beyond your current balance and your transactions. Um, we tr when we did that, we kind of we kind of liked it, uh, but we did it small scale. But when we we saw the functionality within Tink, um, we were thinking, okay, how are we going to approach this? We can approach this in two different ways. Um, we knew that they had uh, spoke spoken to ABN Amro at that time, and uh, ABN Amro had launched an application in uh, in Holland called Clip. I don't know, and they taught me how to pronounce that. Uh, it's grip, but it's, I thought it was grip first, get a grip. <laughs> um, they launched that as a standalone application for 10,000 customers. You could try it out, see what they liked. When we looked at the offer of transactional analysis, um, we, fa um, we faced that this kind of uh, insight in our uh, see, understand, decide, act model would fit very well to integrate into our core offer. So we look at our core offer and say, OK, which are our segments in using our mobile application for private customers? And we quickly realized that when we compare that to the Tink application, um, our customers are maybe not as advanced. They have a, so many different use cases, as I mentioned, like budgets, tagging, a lot of stuff that maybe a more tech-savvy part of the population would appreciate or someone who liked to uh, get a hold of that. So when we're trying to work out the concept on how, what, how we're going to use their technology, we, we scale it down, actually. And we try to take and break it into pieces. We, they have like 50 different categories. We chose nine different expanded categories to, to just place in our application uh, through a lot of service design and prototyping, see is there any, any category they, uh, the customers lack? Is there anything they, they want added? And sure enough, as soon as we launched the nine category expense chart, which is currently in our application, um, and the first question was, when can I, when can I get my own categories? Um, when can I make, make it myself? But it's, it's very, when, when we launched, it was very, very appreciated as well. So I think that when, when we take on a, a technolo uh, technology platform and try to adapt that into our current offering, especially we want to integrate that into our core uh, interface, which is our mobile, mobile app, the, um, the most common interface faced by our customers, uh, we need to um, really consider the way we build trust for those applications. So if we were to launch everything at once, I think some people would have liked it, but half of them would have not, never been used for the first two years, probably, because we need to make, a, make sure that we onboard our customers uh, in, a, in a good customer journey to all the potential use cases we can have on that platform. And by doing that, we can also look at other use cases. Is there any part of the think and taking data we can use on a different scale? And that is something we looked a bit through the innovation lab. Because mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you look at your uh, economy, I any economic activity is basically a, a reflection of how you view the world. So when we look at what we can do, when we look at technology companies outside fintech, there's so many different companies that can benefit from being paired and cross-run, cross-reference against uh, financial data. Uh, for instance, uh, carbon emissions is one of them. Um, a lot of our uh, customers are fairly keen on, uh, on our sustainability principles. And um, so we, if we were to cross-reference carbon emissions with, uh, with uh, cons um, yeah, basically consumption, we can provide an insight to that. That would be interesting. But it's not really fintech material, but it's still something we can make fintech if we like to do that. So we did that in an internal pilot. Uh, which is really so in terms of uh, practical aspects of working with Tink, um, did, you br did you bring the team fully in-house? Uh, did you use them as vendors? Or how did the cooperation evolve uh, over different stages? Well, since they were... Uh, well, sorry. No, I, well, I'm just going to add that th there are two aspects. of There is a one investment part of it, as we invested in Tink, uh, and we also have this uh, cooperation. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's actually a two-way cooperation where... We use their technology, in-house our app, uh, and uh, we have offerings in their app. 
Uh, I yeah. do have a uh, question concerning thing. You were using the information uh, of the transactions of S uh, done in SV only? Yes, exactly. Uh, because when we speak about PSD2, then there are two main core uh, services. This is payments and aggregation of information. Have you ever thought, uh, or is it already in the pipeline? The question is to SAB and Swedbank as well, to uh, be the so-called middleman to gather information uh, from the other banks as well and do the work as Tink does for the SAB <coughs> transactions today. I think everyone, <laughs> when reading uh, PSD2, has that kind of idea. I think all banks would um, are, are looking into the options of that. Um, I, certainly I have, but I don't think we have reached a, a conclusion in, in how we want to approach that at the moment. Um, we, we are fairly confident in, in the technology platform that Tink delivers to us and we know what they can do <coughs> and that is something we really, uh, really need to assess going forward. Um, uh, yeah, it's, they're, they're a really interesting company in that, in that sense because they are highly ad adaptive. Um, and uh, if I may, can come into yep. uh, yeah your uh, your question because it kind of touches upon that. I mean they they have team play, um, based in Sweden, so uh, it was a sort of a vendor man vendor process. They they came to our site, we were at their site. Um, uh, they're they're located not far from here, um, and uh, together with them and our IT team, we we set uh, a small team basically working with all all the, these components, everything from the systems integration to risk onto design of the application. Um, so it was, a, it was a very intense uh, time for us uh, working with them, for sure. Um, it could, kind of puts a pressure on the rest of the organization because, uh, as I mentioned before, I work with the backlog of a mobile, um, all mobile development. And um, when we focus a lot of attention on a fintech, we can learn so much, but at the same time, we push aside things that other parts of the organization might want to uh, to get out to the market. And um, this requires the organization to have a buy-in sort of to that, okay, we're gonna make this investment, we, we want this functionality within our application. And um, that, is a, that is a mission, and it's, uh, it was re really a relief to see that we were able to make that adjustment qu fairly quick when we come out, when we try prototyping and everybody understands what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, the, um, oh. So I guess it kind of, um, yeah. the, the question that we'll be getting to, and maybe Janos can take this one, is, is how do you actually uh, set up the governance processes? Because y you're, you're hitting on a, on a very good point. You have capacity constraints in dealing with um, uh, X number of uh, fintech corporations <coughs> in an active phase at any given time, right? So how do you actually set up the governance processes to be able to do more of this at scale uh, if this is the future? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Uh, and it, it really, you know, in, in Swedbank in a way, we, I think we started to work with fintechs before we had all these processes in place. And, and then we learn as we go along. Uh, and you realize that I think Kim is, is no, not Kim, uh, uh, Jury, uh, you mentioned that, that working with fintechs is a little bit like working with millennials. And I think that that's because true. They are. Yeah, yeah, they are. And, and, and we've had you know, several meetings where you uh, meet very uh, exciting people and with great ideas. And, and you, know, you could easily think about this as just to do a plug and play if it was only for the functionality and integration into the systems and so on. But the tough part is really how do we sell this internally? How, how can we go to, you know, um, uh, take a management decision that, that we kind of work with these people uh, when we don't know enough about them, when we, you know, haven't worked out all the compliance uh, and so on. So, so what do we do about that? Yeah, we need to, to uh, you know, first of all, we have discovered that, you know, we can't do what we do because we, we need to have better processes around it. So, so we need to, uh, you know, for different kinds of collaborations uh, and investments and relationships, we, we need to have different processes that are pre-approved by our risk departments, by compliance and so on. So basically when we get into a, a real situation, we know what to do and all the stakeholders are kind of aligned around that. I think that's how, how we, yeah. how, how we are, are going to do it. And, and, and there, there, there are no doubts that we need to be you know, we need to think differently than we've done before. There are processes that it can take, you know, uh, six months to, to come up with a yes to a fintech company because they, they, then they have started to work with, you know, so many other players. 
Uh, and typically, uh, you know, in the first meeting with the fintech company, they say, okay, yes, you're interested in our offering, but okay, can you, uh, can you be quick? Because, you know, we are so, so, uh, <laughs> you know, have so many uh, adverse experience with banks, you know, uh, so, so can you be different? And we need to s tell them that we can be different because we want to be different. So I think we want a lot. We still need to prove a bit how we can adapt to it, but we are very, um, you know, determined to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in some ways, you're all uh, out there scouting for um, certain ideas, right? So maybe without going uh, into too much of detail, but if you can um, give a sense to the audience, which problems are you trying to fix in some ways? Which, uh, which areas are you trying to look for cooperation partners in where you see that would be the way to proceed? Because to have pre-approved process, it means you probably have a good sense of, of, uh, of the areas you are scouting out. Yeah, I think we, we have a dual approach. We we um, we have a kind of an, an outside in one where where, where the uh, the different players come to us. We we you know are part of different communities and so on. But in parallel to that, and, and maybe even more importantly, we are scrutinizing our offering, our, our the strength of our customer offering, um, and identifying the areas where we say, okay, here in these areas we are unlikely to be able to solve this on our own uh, as fast as we want. So let's go out and, and target, target wise look at, at uh, who could potentially help us in this area. So I think that, that's an, a very important process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about yourselves? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's joint efforts uh, as an organization, so we work from, from different aspects of it. I mean, we from the venture side, we look both into do strategic investments, like as Tink was a strategic one, where there is both uh, the sort of financial aspect of that we believe that this can be an exciting company to be owner of, but also there is a cooperation part of it. So that's one. And then we also do traditional financial investments. So there might not be any cooperation with the bank, uh, but we have at least a white flag to, to do the investment. So it could even be a competitor, it could be a challenger bank, it could be, I mean, anything, as long as we get our board to say yes to that. Uh, and our board is actually, yeah, most of them sit in, uh, in the executive uh, board within the bank. So that's, that's good. Uh, but also challenging. Um, so, so, yeah, so we work from one aspect, uh, meeting companies from investment side of view. Uh, many of them uh, nowadays, compared to the companies that we met with five years ago that didn't have any interest in the bank, they only came to us because they wanted to uh, use our experience as, as owners and the capital and our network and so on. Uh, but most fintechs today, they uh, when they come to us, they also want to Many of them, either they just want to learn more from the bank, how it actually works, uh, and in most cases, they also want to have a cooperation with the bank, at least when it comes to uh, the, the offering side of things. Uh, of course, if it's uh, more a service provider or a technology provider, um, then it's different. Then they want maybe SAB as a, as a customer at some point. Um, so, uh, so we look into the companies and view them from with our uh, glasses, and then we have our colleagues in digital banking, in the various uh, product management areas within the bank uh, that do, of course, their work from, okay, <coughs> what does the landscape look like within card business, uh, which has been a bit challenged over the years, or within payments, or within, and so on. Uh, and then it's more of a matrix uh, solution how we it's not very organized I would say uh, and I'm not sure if it's if it's uh, good to organize too much uh, you might kill it uh, if you organize too much uh, but I think it's important once you decide to I mean we have a set structure for us how we decide uh, it always have to be um, someone ver very <laughs> at the top to decide that yes we're gonna support Tink uh, if it's sort of a middle manager who says, I want to do this, it will take a very long time and to get it happen. So it has to be someone at the board who actually um, uh, supports it. I think that's uh, a learning. Uh, and um, also when it comes to the process as such, I mean, Tink was more or less the first one uh, during the autumn now. Uh, we've done a similar, not similar solution, but uh, cooperation with another company. Uh, and I made the investment and it was finalized after the summer. 
uh, and uh, we can make use of a lot of what we learned. I mean, everything was like, okay, so how did we do in Tink? Uh, what we did learn from that? Let's talk to the person who was uh, responsible for that part of it, and so on. And also, I'm sure it's the same within in the other banks as well, but to make... Um, uh, if there is a new product, I mean, it's uh, in a way a new product because uh, even if it's not ours, it's uh, part of our offering. Uh, it has to go through uh, a new product approval committee. Uh, and the first time they see something like this, they're going to be, ah, <laughs> no, I'm not sure if we're going to do this. Uh, it's it's too risky. It's uh, I, I can't assess this, or uh, I'm not I'm not used to it. Uh, but now the second time we did it, uh, it was so much easier. Uh, people were, I mean, only just going from one case to two cases. Uh, they had learned so much, and they had changed a lot of their. Um, idea of okay, so SAB is actually going to do this more times. Uh, we just have to learn. Learn, yeah. Do you need to uh, get the uh, finance inspection uh, with new product approvals as well? Yeah. Uh, if we're uh, as an investor, uh, if we own more than ten percent, uh, there is one a type of approval that is needed, and if it's less than less than ten, it's uh, definitely a quick one. But it has to be uh, sent in before we can be approved as the owners. Um, but from the owner side, yeah. Okay, from, but not the not from the product side, but a product. I don't think so. Not from I'm the not product sure. side, no. but um, I mean, if we launch something, we're we're gonna run it in our own name, basically. Um, that's what we've done so far. And um, when we do that, um, the the entirety of the of the functionality we offer will fall under the same same principles as we do. So we ha they have to face the same compliance. Um, it's funny you should mention this, trying to, from a mid-level, trying to get uh, a collaboration working. I tried to do that. Uh, it went fairly well. Um, but when the thing uh, I think th that that is very interesting when you speak to fintechs is that when we speak of compliance issues, um, w they uh, almost answer the question before we have time to, to ask it. And that I think is uh, really interesting. And um, in terms of our own organization, I think this uh, more collaboration will require more uh, technical uh, competence from the assessors when approving a new, a new product. And I think that's uh, where we're moving, and we moved quite a lot you, over these past few years uh, with that technical competence to speed up the approval process. So when you said the fintechs respond to the compliance question before you ask, it means that they've now been through the learning curve as well? I, I presume so. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, um, I think that um, when we when we listen to a uh, a pitch or an idea, um, um, if we if we seem to think that this is a good, good match, as I was into with with uh, our current offer, at least from a channel perspective, then um, then um, we st we say GDP, and then they say R, and then they continue. Um, and and they um, they obviously already thought about that, especially once they are situated here uh, in the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, they know that the questions are going to get there. Uh, and as we l get to know them more and they get to know us more and how we perceive risk, I think uh, it will just speed up the process over the coming years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. By the way, do have you had positive experiences um, <coughs> when you are learning uh, from the fintechs themselves how to do better compliance? Yeah, I, I'd say. Um, I'm, I'm lucky I don't work in compliance. <laughs> uh, but but um, I, I think that um, um, the people we work with uh, quite rapidly embrace that. And they need to have a different technical understanding of, of the inner workings of, of, of uh, the function we're about to, uh, to buy or to invest in or to integrate. And uh, and what that will affect? I think then I think it's a it's a different question, in, um, depending on what level that application is on. So might go into a little technicalities here, but but if it's a, if it's a background function affecting our core systems, then I think our, our assessors would need be very very particular about assessing that. If we're going to do something like uh, AB and AMRO did, for instance, they white labeled the Tink application that was already av available for consumers and launched that aside from their own application. Of course, compliance would be a very important question there. But as we're not moving into the territory of um, affecting our core functionality, affecting the way SEB um, behaves within the um, financial industry in Sweden and payments for 
especially. Um, yeah, then uh, th I think we can look it at it at many different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, well, our assessors are becoming very, very aware. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, to answer this question, I've seen cryptocurrency companies who do a lot better compliance than most banks do. Mm. So, and this is, I think, purely because they have a, a more native access to technology. So, so they're automating everything, doing you know uh, tens of layers of, of different types of screening that normal banks would ever do. So this is definitely changing. And in terms of onboarding different um, uh, fintechs, and what our, our approach is, as, as Estonians, we're very pragmatic. So it's numbers in, numbers out. Um, so we look at our core strengths and we look at our weaknesses. So our strengths today are payments in the Eurozone. So we offer that as a service to fintech. So natural connection for us would be payment companies, payment companies who don't have access to Euro, for example. And on the other hand, um, talking about stakeholders and, and stakeholder um, commitment and fast tracking uh, the companies in the company, uh, we've had strong support from our, our, um, our board and our, our majority owners. Uh, for cryptocurrencies, so we we got to do stuff around cryptocurrencies very early on, uh, before other banks were afraid to to say the name, and, and we're using distributed ledger and and stuff before that. So um, this is definitely a must to have. You know, if if you want to do something in the fintech field, you ha you have to have you know the the top top level um, commitment there definitely. Mm -hmm. So we actually bring um, and uh, please do jump in if you have any any questions uh, from the from the audience here. Yeah. Let's see. So we take a few. Uh, I have a short question ab about uh, this fintech collaboration, and maybe uh, as an example, we can use Tink. In uh, Lithuania, we often discuss uh, that uh, for banks, the benefit from co cooperating with fintech is uh, obvious. This, uh, in for, for example, in Tink, it means uh, better customer engagement, higher customer experience, that means more interactions with customers, more opportunities to probably sell our products to these customers, and that's how we make money. And uh, for fintech, if Tink is also a side product who that um, um, offer a service to end customer, uh, what is the business case for them as a standalone? Uh, I understand now the, the, there are examples of white labeling solutions that they sold it as an IT service to some banks, but I understand they started first of all as a standalone service. So what, what possible business case is there for them? And if it, if you may ask, answer, are they currently profitable company? Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the profitable side, I, I'm afraid I can't answer. But on the, in the rest, I can. I mean, they they ranked up a pretty large user base, uh, around 400,000 individuals. And um, those 400,000 individuals are pretty active in their uh, in their application. And um, uh, like I mentioned, Tink, and, or like I mentioned before, Tink has the aggregator function. So that can create this kind of holistic view of your economy. So um, that, in a sense, uh, creates the opportunity for them to be able to, uh, to actually sell products. So what, in part, what we do with them uh, in there interface is that we place uh, mortgage of it offers uh, when we, whenever they can see that a client um, uh, is, is a client we might want to approach with a mortgage offer we can do that and they can of course in a way benefit from that um, but also I, I, their, their product in itself is quite advanced it appeals to people who really want to be in charge of their own economy or their own finance, I should say. And um, um, that is the, the main difference. When, when we look at technology sharing, and uh, we can share their ideas, they can share our ideas on how to go forward. Uh, but they can apply it to their segment, and we can apply it to our general segment. And I think they still have the ambition. I mean, I think that when we started, to, when I spoke to them a long time ago, they said, OK, we're going to eliminate you, <laughs> basically. They, w they want their application to succeed, and, and I think they will in their segment. Um, and uh, I think they will be fairly profitable on that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Christina, do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, Mary, I made more general comment, but what has dawned upon a lot of, uh, I think, the, the fintechs and uh, yeah, banks as well, but uh, especially if you're a fintech with a app, uh, you uh, compete with a lot of other apps. It's the bank app, it's the, it's the game app, it's the children savings app, it's uh, depending on what you do. Maybe it's about five apps that you can actually make use of more frequently. Uh, so the challenge for if it's Tink or if it's another savings app or when you, when you target sort of a small segment of, of your life, 
um, then it will be, be difficult for you to be relevant um, and be used in that frequency that you would like them, uh, your customer to use your, uh, your solutions. So I think that's uh, also a reason why it started out some years ago is that fintechs were going to kill the banks. I mean, that's how it was spoken on. Uh, there was a Stockholm Tech Festival some years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, then it took some time. And I think today very few say that. Uh, it's more that, okay, we will we will make use of each other, just like you um, uh, yeah, said yourself, that there is a clear reasoning why the banks would like to, because they don't have the the resources, if you talk about the legacy banks uh, being stuck in the regulation and the legacy uh, IT infrastructure. Um, hopefully that will change over the years, but that's the, the, the fact as of today. Um, but also the fintechs realize that the banks, they already have. I mean, among the banks, you have all the customers in the country. Uh, if you get to sell your solution to that bank, you will access that customer base. Uh, and doing that on your own with the, that sort of small solution, you will definitely reach out to uh, the early adopters. Uh, uh, that's what Tink did and all the other apps that we have in, uh, in our countries. Uh, but... Uh, to sort of conquer the the daily usage uh, of uh, of a mobile phone user's um, app frequency, uh, that's that's the challenge, and then that's where we will need each other. Mm -hmm. Now, as we conclude, I'll ask the last question, which is to to ask for brief answers. If if you look at 2018 and in the coming years, do you see more of the fintech cooperation being on the consumer side um, of uh, the the service or on the kind of the backbone or the infrastructure of the banks and finding ways to collaborate there, maybe between the banks, between the fintechs, and in all sorts of uh, uh, combinations. So, I'll say to all of you. I think it's a it's a very good question. I think we will, um, uh, you know, move more and more towards. If the first applications has been very much in the consumer space, uh, we're moving more and more into into the, s the smaller companies and also backbone. So I say that would be a more uh, balanced uh, picture as we move along. The speed is difficult to say, but it's definitely moving in that direction. I would say. Yeah, I can just fully agree on that. Uh, and that's also just, we talked about uh, within blockchain, we hope to see like real cases, not only use cases. Uh, when it comes to uh, the consumer side of things, we've already seen true cases. But when it comes to more AI and, uh, and so forth, um, it's been, I think, a lot of companies or fintechs, they, uh, they definitely put that buzzword into uh, when describing their products, um, but not that many have a, a true AI function that appeals to, to the banks. And I would say a lot of banks, of course, work with that themselves already, uh, but more on uh, making use of consultancies and doing their data lakes where they sort of pour out all the information that they have. Uh, in order to uh, make make sense of what what can we learn about our customers and how can we help them to uh, to get smarter, uh, so I think you will definitely see more on on that side and robotics and yeah, okay. the backbone and processes. Um, I think we're going to see a lot of both, very much so. Um, when when we look at um, this spectrum here, I think a lot of a lot of companies are wor working on the back end of things. A lot of them are working on the front end of things. Um, those who get really much attention are then the, the companies working in both, um, where they have a um, potential use case. And I think that and that is what we're we're going to see a, a, a lot of, uh, at least from the consumer side where I'm from. Um, those who approach consumers and can uh, can help us uh, with that from a channel perspective. Uh, and that's going to be really interesting. I think it's going to be more and more additions to my backlog in, in uh, elements that will um, have to be uh, assessed and taken care of uh, in relation to all the other things that are com is coming from the organization itself and our own initiatives. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree. Uh, the consumer way would definitely continue. Uh, I think it's... It's, it's really bad to make predictions, but I think that we're, we're also going to start seeing um, consolidation. So especially uh, in the bank light sector where, you know, if, if you have a look at the, the, the bank lights or uh, application banks that you have in the UK today, the list is incredible. You know, there's no way all of these companies could survive. So they either have to merge or, or they will be weeded out. The weak ones will disappear, especially if, if, if the Brexit happens, for example, in the UK. So there will be some, 
some companies missing soon, I'm, I'm, I'm predicting. Um, SME wave is, is, is very much a hot topic right now, so that will definitely go, go on. Um, but in terms of corporates, I think this is kind of the, the most difficult sector because it's very hard to, to, to agree on anything between corporations. It's, it's very expensive to change the infrastructure, so I think that will, that will definitely happen, but it, it will take a longer time and, and it will be a sl much s slower pace. But uh, yeah, this, this year I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see some consolidation in, in, in consumer area. Great. So let me thank you and thank all the panelists for a wonderful discussion.